This is the KJ Show. The KJ Show with host Dr. Katherine Johnson is a mix of breaking news and practical advice on the many ways in which the energy industry can affect you and your family. Catherine will combine energy updates and conversations with leaders in the energy efficiency community. So please welcome your host, Dr. KJ. Hey, and welcome to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV network. And today we're going to talk about something that's a little controversial, but I think definitely needs to be addressed. The ethical dilemma of climate change. We've been talking about parts, pits, bits and pieces throughout the last 39 episodes, but I thought I'd kind of zero in on that topic today. But, you know, and that's why I'm wearing my black sheep sweater. So hopefully people won't think I'm a black sheep, but rather will appreciate the fact that I'm trying to bring the whole story to you, not just the bits and pieces that we see in the news. But I got to start with my favorite topic, which is um, breaking news in the in the realm of you can't make this stuff up. And it ties in quite nicely, actually, with the theme of uh, ethical dilemmas. So Biden, who is, you know, a big environmentalist, is now pushing for uh, U.S. natural gas imports to increase, especially to Europe, given the fact that they have a shortage, obviously, with the Ukrainian Russian war situation. Um, so they, he wants to actually increase the number of liquefied natural gas exports to Europe to free its dependence from Russian gas. The problem is that this is not something the environmentalists or the climate activists are in favor of. Um, the competing priorities have relate, resulted in a debate over whether federal regulators should allow more natural gas exports and whether to improve approve construction to actually do that. Um, but this is actually contradictory to all of his initiatives to promote a, a move away from fossil fuels like natural gas. And obviously the environmental groups are very opposed to this. Advocacy groups are asking the Department of Energy to do the opposite and actually adopt a more rigorous policy that will not actually allow the ramp up of more liquefied natural gas um, production facilities and exports because they're saying that spending billions of dollars on fossil fuel infrastructure would, with a projected multi-decade lifespan locks in the dependence of fossil fuels in Europe. So the gas customers are in the United States, meanwhile, are facing rising prices because of the shortages. So isn't that interesting? We have a president that is promoting a climate, a fossil fuel future, at the same time promoting, um, this is just one of the many things that he's promoting, that actually kind of counters his policies and is, again, to me, I think, uh, pretty much a dilemma, if certainly not a very um, puzzling stand. And obviously, you know, this is why I don't think we can rush headlong into solutions. I think we need to think about things very carefully, and that's where I think in our whole discussion today, the fact that these policies that are intended to be good sometimes aren't really well thought out, and certainly the unintended consequences um, are, not, are not always considered. So, an I love it. So, how's that? Okay, <laughs> I love it when things go wrong. As they always do. This is probably me. Um, I have the wrong camera. Okay, so John, Michael, what do you want me to do? I love being live and having technical difficulties. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to easysense.com.
And I can't really talk about ethical dilemmas without obviously having some technical difficulties. So I appreciate you hanging in there with me. Um, but the point I was trying to make was that there is some there is some concern about pushing too fast towards policies. Um, and of course, other news you can't make up is that I love this climate activists in Switzerland have glued themselves to a tunnel in the Alpine. It stretches a 10 mile long tunnel. That's a main route that covers northern, that connects northern Switzerland to Italy. And they're creating a bottleneck. And you know why they're gluing themselves inside this tunnel? Um, because they want to block the main route to protest global warming. This, they believe that the group is called Renovate Switzerland, um, basically wants to say that they want the government of Switzerland to change, take climate change seriously and renovate the buildings, all the buildings by 2035. They're thinking that the government is ignoring it and that Switzerland is facing all kinds of global warming challenges. It's warming faster than twice the global rate and the glaciers are melting and they really want to put, you know, this protest, they're taking it literally to the streets. Meanwhile, the Swiss government has actually pledged to invest $4.1 billion or $4.54 billion US dollars um, in renovating buildings and modernizing them and doing all of the other measures that these environmental protest groups are protesting against. So I don't know how gluing yourself to a roadway and blocking traffic is going to really get anyone's attention other than the angry motorists who are commuting or vacationing. But also, it seems like the government's already investing four and a half billion dollars in these things. What else do they want? So again, it sometimes seems like it's a little more posturing for some of these environmental groups than perhaps reality. But yeah, that's what makes interesting, makes my life so interesting. Um, and then here's the, my favorite story in the segment this week. And sometimes I just have to laugh because I don't understand how people can take this stuff seriously. But then again, it's the Silicon Valley where we do have the Silicon Valley bank foreclosure failure, right? Well, guess what um, big tech wants to do in Silicon Valley? They're spending $925 million to suck all the carbon from the air. They're basically funding a really big vacuum cleaner that's going to take out the carbon in the air. Four major tech companies have partnered with a, this company called Frontier, which is a fund to basically pay, uh, pull carbon from the sky. And they have a lot of different ideas, but they want to basically create an atmosphere sucking out. They want to create a giant vacuum. Um, and they've already, you know, and I'm wondering how though that they would know to suck out just the carbon and not the oxygen or the hydrogen or the nitrogen. They said removing carbon is costly. I would think so ranging from hundreds of dollars to more than $2,000 per ton. But other ones say that maybe this is just a, 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 a ruse and that it may be easier to actually, you know, distract from pulling, from addressing carbon emissions now by saying they have a solution sometime in the future. It's all really interesting and I think quite a dilemma. Um, but I'm Katherine Johnson, I'm your host on the, on the KJ Show on the Bold Brave TV network, and we'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to EasySense.com and learn how, with your help, we can fight these horrific brain disorders. That's EasySense.com to learn more and help support the Broderick Foundation. Author, radio show host, and coach John M. Hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, Unlock Your Full Potential with Limitless Growth, published by iUniverse. Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. 
Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them. We discover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And welcome back to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV Network. Today I'm talking about the ethical dilemma of climate change. And actually, when I started researching this topic, I was sort of amazed at how many interesting ethical dilemmas I came across of. First, apparently, the climate research that we've been, you know, relying on, there's some discussion now within the scientific community. Is it objective or is it biased towards promoting particular uh, political agendas? And you won't believe what I found. A Harvard professor who used to work for the Obama administration is now under scrutiny because guess what? She's linked to the fossil fuel industry. Colleagues and students are scrutinizing Harvard environmental law professors links to the fossil fuel industry after she was awarded a prestigious research grant to invest corporate climate pledges. Turns out Jody Freeman is a paid member of Con board member of the ConocoPhillips company, one of the largest oil and gas companies in the world, and she's to investigate climate change pledges. Seems like the fox and the hen approach, maybe? And, um, and ConocoPhillips was ranked as one of the 13th most polluting uh, company in the world, according to The Guardian. So um, her colleagues are naturally thinking this might be a conflict of interest. You're serving as a member on an oil and gas conglomerate, but you're po supposedly representing environmental concerns and, and you're supposed to promote uh, you know global solutions and climate change. Professor Freeman also uh, chairs a presidential committee on sustainability and was recently awarded funding to lead research on corporate net zero targets. But her colleagues say that this is actually a conflict of interest because her fossil fuel ties threaten to qu raise questions about her ability to actually be neutral or even objective. That's a really scary thought. Um, and this isn't the only example, I wish it was, but apparently the Guardian in London also revealed that an Exxon scientist, another one of those evil oil companies, right, has taught a class at Princeton and Harvard and is among the top select universities that received the most donations from the fossil fuel industry from 2010 to 2020. The Boston Globe actually unre un, uh, revealed that the gas industry has been writing peer-reviewed academic journals through the University of Massachusetts. So it does seem that some of the climate research may not be all it seems, and that's actually what I wanted to talk about today, because it turns out that there is no, believe it or not, breaking news, still no consensus on global warming among scientists due to faulty research. Now, this is really critically important because I'm always told, and I get to conferences, and I'm always, oh, you know, it's settled science. Actually, it isn't. When you start digging deeper into this, what you find out is that most scientists outside of climatology believe that global warming is happening, but scientists who are actually climate scientists say that's not true. Their policy initiatives derive from highly unscientific, uncertain scientific theories that are based on the unsupported assumption that catastrophic global warming follows the burning of fossil fuels and immediate actions. They do not agree. Rather, these scientists, there's 50 of them, um, 60 of them actually, have signed a letter that says the overwhelming majority of climate scientists in the United States do not believe this. And they actually think that the quote that led all this notion that climate change was settled science from a report in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which you see quoted everywhere, was actually misleading. The uh, policy summary, the key takeaway that was immediately scooped up by the politicians and the journalists who didn't do their fact checking, um, actually found out the original draft document did not say this at all. In fact, what they did is they took the policy summary statement out of context and altered the scientific conclusions. They altered it. Now, I have a I have research degree. You, uh, I mean, plagiarism, altering scientific facts, that is a 
definitely a violation of ethics. And had I ever done any of those things, I would have been expelled, rightly so, from any academic institution I was involved with. Dr. Frederick Seitz, head of the former head of the United States National Academy of Scientists, now he obviously knows what he's talking about, says, in more than 60 years as a member of the American scientific community, I have never witnessed a more disturbing corruption of the peer review process that the events led to the, uh, this IPCC report. Now here's a leading scientist saying that what we've heard about for the last, since 1995, is actually a misleading and factual misrepresentation. That to me is an ethical dilemma. And why we haven't ever really talked about it or why I'm one of the lone voices here, black sheep maybe, in the industry is because it isn't what the politicians want to promote. So the real scientific consensus is they need to have policy making being guided by fact, not speculation. And most of the, the IPC members believe that certain climate models do not accurately portray the atmospheric ocean system. They actually, the models are wrong. And other measurements from satellites have shown that there's been no global warming. Um, there's actually been global cooling between 1979 and 1994. First, fundamentally, though, the scientific theory of global warming assumes that the maximum warming will happen at the poles, when in actuality, the poles and the temperatures have dropped by over 0.88 centigrade, degree centigrade over the past 50 years. So scientists using actual data have said that the models are wrong and this is something i'm well aware of on my own personal level since my husband's a climatologist uh an atmosphere he is a meteorologist in upper atmosphere but you know he's been telling me this for years i said well i don't know and now i'm finding out maybe it's true the scientific models do not take into account the ocean sink um the other problem is is that these apocalyptic claims about climate change are also wrong um, no credible scientific body has ever said that climate change threatens the collapse of civilization, much less the extinction of human species. Our children are going to die. Where's the evidence for that? A BBC interviewer asked. The uh, claims have been disputed, but, you know, scientists are agreeing. However, most scientists do not agree with this. And this science, another scientific um, expert, uh, Andrew Neal from BBC, pointed out, he looked through the I. PCC reports and found no reference to any of these cataclysmic predictions. So it's been hyped. It's chicken little. The sky is falling. It's not true. And, and there's no reference to people dying. Rather, the reference is that there's not even any reference to climate change disasters. Um, there's no robust evidence that disasters are displacing people. And there's limited evidence that climate causes, climate change actually causes sea levels. What they also point out, and I know this is a little controversial, is that researchers who study this, the climate researchers, actually have found that other factors are more likely to attribute to climate change. Wars, economic unrest, poverty. Those are much more real life problems than climate change. So I know this is a topic, I'll revisit it in the next couple of segments, but I wanted to at least introduce it. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV network. And we'll be right back. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality? But it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating. Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. Yeah, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic. On the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? 
Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. And welcome back to The KJ Show. I'm Katherine Johnson, your host, Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV network, uh, and I'm been talking today about something a little controversial, which is why I'm wearing my black sheep sweater, talking about the ethic, ethical dilemma of climate change. And I didn't get through all of the data I have from my last segment, so I want to pull a little bit more in and then we'll switch topics. But this is one of the reasons I'm developing a Substack newsletter, because I have so much information in so many places that I can cite what I'm saying and actually back up what I say. Um, everything I say is actually not my ideas. These are things that are printed in the press. They are sourced. They are referenced. I have a, when I wrote my dissertation, let me just tell you, the reference pages were 15, 15 pages long in my, in my dissertation. So I know how to footnote and I know how to reference. And so the stuff I say on the show is not my only opinion. It's actually opinions from people that are far smarter than I am. And getting back to the IP, CC report, um, IPCC report, this climate scientist actually said that climate change has been outweighed by other factors. Researchers found that climate has affected organized armed conflicts within countries, but there's other drivers too, such as low socioeconomic development and low capabilities that are actually much more influential. So it's actually the problems we've been facing for centuries, poverty, inequality, uh, in access to food, those types of things. Economic development also, though, on the flip side, has actually made us less vulnerable to climate change, according to these scientists. And there's been a 99.7% decline in the death toll from natural disasters since its peak in 1931. So climate change is not causing more people to die. In fact, in 1931, 3.7 million people died from natural disasters. In 2018, 11,000. So yes, we're having tornadoes, we're having tsunamis, we're having all of these terrible climactic events, but they're not actually causing catastrophic harm because our economy is better, our resources are better, people aren't getting swept away like the Johnstown flood. And that decline occurred over a period when the global population increased. Another issue we hear about often in climate change discussions, and I know I'm creating some, some consternation, I'm sure, but the, um, the other estimates is about the sea, rise, sea level rises. Are they going to rise two feet? Maybe that's what they're saying by 2100. Um, but they have to remember the Netherlands has been underwater for seven, 400 years. And they're seven meters below sea level, and they've managed to adopt. Venice is also underwater, and I want to be in the concrete business in Venice. They seem to be able to, to, to always figure out a strategy back. But these claims of crop failure and famine and mass death are not supported. Humans today produce enough food for 10 billion people, 25% more than we need, and scientific bodies predict that increases. In fact, we're getting better at increasing wheat yields, according to the UN. Food and Agriculture Organization forecasts crop yields are increasing 30% by 2050, and that's in the poorest parts of the world. So the wheat yields have increased 100 to 300 percent since the 1960s. So I guess what I'm really trying to say is that this this climate dread that's been capturing some of the imagination isn't really happening. And one of the uh, most famous quotes I had was from an Australian climate scientist, Tom Wigley, who said, the thought that the claim that climate change threatens civilization is wrong. All of these young people have been misinformed, and partly it's Greta Thunberg's fault. Not deliberately, but she's wrong. Climate scientists are now actually starting to push back, and some journalists are actually starting to question it. And all this is doing is creating rhetoric that's very divisive and makes it a political issue, not one that should actually, when it should be an actual scientific issue. We've got to come up with some kind of middle ground where do you reasonable things to mitigate the risk and try to lift people out of poverty and make them more resilient. That is really the solution to climate change and to all of our global problems. But 
I um, I just wanted to point these things out to you because it is worrisome to me as a researcher and an evaluator and a some a pseudoscientist of some sort. I, I actually do have a doctorate in business administration. So, you know, I'm not a physicist, but I know how to do research. And this kind of misleading reporting bothers me as a former journalist. And here's something else I found in my uh, review this week, something I, I will touch on now and perhaps later. Um, climate at clean energy now. They're going to promote clean energy at one of the wealthiest communities up in Massachusetts near Cape Light Compact, which is, you know, Massachusetts is sort of near Martha's Vineyard, um, but they're going to actually make these policies available for the rich. Free renewable energy tech is coming to Cape Cod homes, but it's only going to help 25 low-income homes. They're actually, you know, this has taken five years for the Cape Cod Energy Organization to receive support even to offer um, Cape Vineyard Electric Offering will provide free technologies to 25 low-income homes in the region. They're going to give them a mix of uh, heat pumps, solar panels, financing, battery storage, and they're going to roll it out next April, in April. And they're going to focus on affordable housing, but the problem is they're only focusing on 25 houses. And I know there are more than that in uh, Cape Cod, and I'm surprised they even have 25 affordable housing units in Cape Cod. The program will be offered to 80 deed-restricted affordable homes, which will receive solar panels free of charge, and 25 will also receive two batteries. Um, but market rate homes also get these homes, so it's not just the low-income folks that are going to benefit. And that seems to be another theme that bothers me, is that every time there's this new energy policy promoting something for affordable housing, some of the funds seem to be diverted to help other communities that folks that maybe don't need it, um, a lot of these rebates incentives, you know, folk, frankly, wealthier people don't necessarily need that support. Um, achieving climate goals in the Commonwealth is not going to come cheap. Yet another reason I'm concerned about all these push. If we don't bring very rich incentives, this uh, Cape Cod spokesman said, for our low and moderate income customers, they'll be left behind. But I'm wondering why we have to push so hard when it's only going to benefit a very few. And how is this at all cost effective? I do cost benefit analysis. This does not make sense. But here's something else that's even more disturbing than other what they're doing in Cape Cod is that they did a study that showed that racial inequality in the deployment of rooftop housing in solar energy. Now, I'm not surprised, but it is a concern. And that's something that Joe Biden is trying to address in the Inflation Reduction Act by promoting more solar. But the problem is a lot of these affordable homes don't have the ability or the infrastructure to support solar, rooftop solar. Fewer solar PV panels were installed in African-American, Hispanic neighborhoods than in compared to white neighborhoods. And deployment has apparently occurred primarily in white neighborhoods, even after controlling for income and home ownership, according to a study Patrick published by the University of Berkeley, California. So they're pointing out that there's a social and racial inequality that exists because of this promotion of certain kinds of uh, energy technologies that, again, may not be ready. These homes may not be ready. And in fact, in England, they have a new law and the, the environmental re regulations are so stringent that the landlords who own these low-income properties are going to tear them down rather than make them more energy efficient. That's creating a huge problem of where are these low-income people going to live? So as we want to move towards a better future, we have to make sure the people that need it the most, the most vulnerable, aren't left behind. And um, that's a concern I have when we're pushing for all these policies that who's going to really benefit. But um, I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV network. Um, we've been watching the KJ show. Hope you're enjoying it. And we'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy 
ccsense.com and learn how, with your help, we can fight these horrific brain disorders. That's easysense.com to learn more and help support the Broderick Foundation. Author, radio show host, and coach, John M. Hawkins, reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them. We discover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And welcome back to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV network. Today I'm talking about the ethical level of climate change. And I really hope you can dial in and join the conversation um, because this is a little more controversial than I like to be. But frankly, I think these stories are underreported in, in what I would think the press. But, you know, it doesn't take a lot of effort for me to find these stories. Um, and that's the thing that really bothers me. And as someone who used to be a journalist and someone who's always sort of curious and a little skeptical, I'm always wondering where is the skepticism that we need? What happened to the objectivity? Because no matter what articles I read, it seems that they're skewing one way or the other, which is not how I was taught to do things in, at IU's journalism school back in the day. And um, nor was I taught to do that in my business, business ethics classes either. So this is why this topic is of particular interest to me. We're live, 866-451-1451. And um, I don't know if I'll have any callers today, but I do have some more interesting things to share with you, sort of building on our topic of this e inequality, this social inequality that seems to be created as we push towards different solutions. So now this is my favorite story, I think, of the week. Um, I love it. New York climate law has now defined ritzy communities with million dollar homes as disadvantaged. And this is something else that's been part of the Inflation Reduction Act that Joe Biden is pushing so hard for. Part of the, one of the components of his is that we've got to start having um, in investments in disadvantaged communities. They have to be sort of, that's one of the, the, the components of it. One of the pillars is you can't just give all this government money. We have to make sure it goes into disadvantaged communities. But then all the because um, kind of defining what is disadvantaged, kind of like what is is, the definition of is. So um, the New York state officials have actually determined that multiple high-end income villages that boast million-dollar homes are disadvantaged, opening the door for areas to, increase in, in, to enjoy increased energy development funding from the IRA. The Climate Justice Work Working Group released a list of disadvantaged communities as mandated under the 2019 Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Historically disadvantaged communities are defined by um, required to receive no less than 35% of clean energy program funding. So it sounds great on paper, yes, and I totally believe that there are millions of examples of where power part plants have been cited and highways have been cited in areas that are not really good or they're not healthy. It's been in historically African American communities or Hispanic communities or minority neighborhoods that sort of get the worst of, of where we put these plants and fossil fuel plants and coal plants. And, and I understand this. This is actually a true fact. But what happened in New York State was that um, there's a working group and these villages that they identified included Tuckahoe and Shinecock, two ritzy neighbors in the Hamptons on Long Island. So somehow these homes that are multi-million dollar homes qualify as disadvantaged. You know why? You know what the loophole is? Their median home price, for example, is $4.2 million. Um, but the town of Southampton boasts a median income of 108,000, 57% higher than nationwide. And the home is also uh, area to the home only, invitation only, very ritzy golf club. The definition is, because it got concluded, is because it happens to have 
Southampton happens to recognize the Shinecock Indian Nation, a federally, federally recognized indigenous tribe. Because that's also out there on Long Island, that is then included as part of this disadvantaged group. So they're lumping in the Indian Reservation with all the other towns, and this there creates the problem. So there are 19 census tracts that have at least 5% of the land is owned by an Indian Reservation. This provision then mandates that communities should be, receive a substantial share of the money, um, which requires 40% of federal investments to flow to disadvantaged communities that are marginalized, underserved, and overburdened. But look at the problem here. The problem is that the communities that are considered disadvantaged are a smaller component of the larger communities. So how is there any guarantee that the money will actually flow to the Native American Indian Reservation rather than flow to the wealthy communities in the Hamptons. And this is a concern that's come up in several conferences, uh, sessions that I was in where recently, where they were talking about the fact that, you know, this push for electric vehicles and solar ready homes in low income neighborhoods and the fact that they're going to have these funding to help make sure that the dollars are allocated to low income and disadvantaged communities. But what about these loopholes? And how are we not going to make sure that the people who get the funding actually need it? And also, as I was pointing out last segment, a lot of these low-income homes are going to take too much money to be, to be retrofitted and aren't going to cost a lot of money. And so landlords you know, may, may just tear these homes down, and that may cause a crisis as well. So again, and I was talking to a colleague of mine who actually mentioned that MassSave has been spending, oh, upwards of a billion dollars in weatherization and energy efficiency programs, and they've rightly done quite a lot of good work. But the problem is there's still a large portion of the homes, the low-income uh, uh, housing in the state that have never been weatherized. And the reason is because they have problems. They have structural foundation issues. They call them, they had to be remediated. They have mold, they have mildew, they may have, um, you know, uh, wiring problems and but those kinds of solutions are much more expensive than just going in and putting in insulation and, and maybe a couple new windows or a new door so um, which is what most weatherization programs do now the federal government is the Department of Energy is trying to look at ways to finally start doing what I think is the right thing and spend money on helping to improve the structural integrity of these low-income houses rather than either tearing them down or just saying, well, we can't solve, we can't just do uh, minimum, minimal weatherization, we can't just go put in new insulation, the houses need more help, well, then why don't we fix the houses that need more help? We either build new houses that are better or we remediate, we get rid of the mold. And that in itself will improve the neighborhoods, that in itself will address the social inequities and also not hopefully displace people. Um, there are solutions that we can have. America is a very resilient and smart um, country and we have a lot of ingenuity but we're not using that ingenuity in the right way and it's frankly wrong for me for, for what I, from what I see for wealthy uh, individuals living in the Hamptons to get somehow the money from the federal government that's allocated for rightly so disadvantaged communities and I think that is happening that that problem happened with the era funding the community weatherization agencies that were in charge of dispersing these funds to help improve the weatherization in low-income houses in their communities were overwhelmed. They didn't have the staff. They didn't have the support. They're historically understaffed. This is a, these are community agencies that are already carrying the burden of trying to help these people that are most vulnerable, people that I work with in evaluating programs, the people that really need energy efficiency programs, and they need clean, safe housing. And there are ways to do it, but not by, you know, cleverly uh, using the definition to uh, skim funds away and actually displace funds that should be used rightly so. And I don't necessarily know if solar PV house roofs are the best way to spend money in improving low-income housing. I personally think we should increase the structural integrity and do things that aren't maybe as fun or as sexy or as appealing, but let's get rid of the mold and mildew. We'll do more to prevent childhood asthma if we do those simple things that are not nearly as expensive as solar panels than just putting a solar panel on a roof that maybe isn't really well designed for it. And as I always say, you need your energy efficiency vegetables before you get renewable desserts. The government seems to be focusing on these desserts in sort of a haphazard fashion where they really need to focus on the basics, the things that make differences in people's lives. And if you reduce their energy burden, 
improve their energy efficiency, then you really are going to solve this problem. But, and that's my hope. I really hope that the government will get around to solving these problems. So, uh, and that's what I think, we, that's what I, that's what I believe. But anyway, you're on the KJ Show on the Bold Brave TV network. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host, and we'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And welcome back. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV Network. Um, you're watching the KJ Show. And today I've been talking about ethical dilemmas. And actually, when I was doing research for this show, I came across a really interesting article written by the fossil fuel producers. Oil, it's published in Oil and Gas Magazine. And they're actually talking about the ethical dilemmas of transitioning to renewable energy. The oil and gas companies are concerned. And they're basically pointing out that they're actually admitting that maybe we do have to shift to non-fossil fuels in the future, but they're sort of raising some concerns that I think are fairly reasonable. It's going to require a significant reorganization of the energy infrastructure, and it's going to also relate to create death ethical dilemmas that, frankly, people aren't really thinking about. Um, power, risk, vulnerability, and resilience. And they also want to make sure that this, you know, because it requires such a significant investment, I mean, John Kerry himself said it's going to take money, money, money to invest, make these technologies feasible, these renewable technologies. And it's also very complex because are you going to benefit one group at the expense of another? Um, and that actually is something that really needs to be just. So the, the oil comp gas companies were actually concerned about something called environmental justice which means to make sure that it's done in an equitable manner that does not disproportionately harm marginalized communities. As I've said, this we have a track record, unfortunately, of doing that. Um, but now with the new renewable energies, there's more economic justice concerns, environmental justice concerns. For example, and this is something I've talked about on previous shows, building wind turbines and solar panels should not result in displacement or harm of indigenous peoples or low-income communities. But they do, and they have. And as we talked about on a show a few weeks ago, actually putting in solar farm, solar panel arrays can actually do harm to the environment and actually maybe affect um, the production of food. So where do we draw the line? Where's the balance? We need to have solar energy, but does that mean people have to go hungry? Or are, is there a way to do both? Uh, renewable projects should be located on areas where they have minimal impact on wildlife. Well, unfortunately, that's not happening either. Wind turbines are killing birds, um, and sometimes I think they actually killed a cow or two. And we've also talked about in this show some of the environmental harm caused by putting up things like, like creating 
a link to uh, hook renewal hook up offshore gas water offshore wind production. They're tearing down forests, and they're connect. They're tearing down in Scotland old old forests, old growth to connect energy to a wind wind grid to the grid in a wind farm. But they're not even sure how that's going to work. So they're plowing ahead. People are plowing ahead with these ideas, but not really thinking about the long-term harmful effects. I don't think cutting down 100-year-old trees is going to really be a good solution to preventing climate change, but that's what's happening. Um, also, decommissioning fossil fuel plants is um, something that they that they should think about when, uh, when we're doing this. Um, and the fact that you know, actually maybe we need to think about a good source, what could be an alternative for those sites. In fact, um, when I was talking about last week's show, some of these cow- coal plants can actually be turned into small modular nuclear reactor plants. That seems like a good replacement, as long as, of course, it's not environmentally damaged. But so environmental justice is a term we hear a lot, but there's environmental justice issues associated with transitioning to renewable energy. So there's also economic justice issues. The sources towards renewable energy, according to this article, must also be done in an economically just manner. Meaning that people who, you know, we don't get rid of all the fossil fuel workers and don't give them another opportunity to get a job. You know, unfortunately, that's happening, though. They're, co- they're closing down plants. They're closing down car, car manufacturing. And what they're doing is creating unemployment in these communities where that is the only major source of employment. Can we, we need to think about what can we bring in to replace those technologies. And these workers need to be retrained. Um, they also, you know, recommend that the government funds uh, research help in retraining these people. And I know that Biden has the intention of having to train the workforce into weatherization, but I think there's other areas they could be trained in as well. Um, another concern, and this is something that um, I've been talking about a little bit, is called intergenerational equity, meaning we don't create problems for future generations. And I think that's the inherent inherent promise of trying to do climate change and trying to save the planet is that we want to make sure that the world is better and safer than what we have for our children. And they talk about reducing climate carbon footprint and making sure that the investments are done silently. And also they're talking, you know, other strategies might be carbon taxes or making it basically economically ineffective to have to have fossil fuels. But I'm not a big fan of taxes to um, instill, you know, in, 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 in foster this kind of I think taxes cause problems and are just one other form of, of uh, I think, injustice, too, because uh, carbon taxes, carbon's a big debate topic as well. But overall, what the oil and gas companies are saying is they need to have corporate responsibility and we need to have um, individual responsibility and societal responsibility. I mean, we all need to be take take um take our, you know, take, take what we do seriously. And no one, including my, most of all myself, I was in favor of anybody polluting the planet or harming the birds or, you know, destroying the beaver habitat. That's not what we're about. But there's ways that sometimes the strategies that we're doing are actually more harmful than they are beneficial. And the short-term implications like tearing down a uh, hundred year old forest to put in an electric bus line, that doesn't make sense either. So, oh, I have a caller from Hawaii. Hello. Hello. Welcome to the show. Didn't put the caller on? Good morning, doctor. Oh, good morning. How are you? Okay. I'm just listening to you on the, on your podcast there. And, uh, yeah. I was just wondering that, uh, do you think next year that the embargoes on Russia will work? Oh, I don't know. It kind of depends on, you mean the oil embargoes and the, the natural gas embargoes that yeah. they put? Um, I don't yeah. know. It's It sort of depends on whether or not the government wants to continue to enforce them. I mean, Europe's really suffering with these uh, with this gas shortage. And, you know, talked about it with the Germans having to you know, rely on other sources of energy. So I think it is sort of dependent on how serious is NATO um, and how, how and, and what's China going to do. I think it's a really global question. That's an excellent and it's an excellent question. But what do you think? Well, I don't think so with Biden in there personally. But not if France doesn't want to help us anymore. Yeah, that's a problem. 
Because of the leaks, you mean the document leaks? No, France going to China and France oh. saying that they don't want to stick with us, Macron. Yeah, well, that's going to be a yeah. That's 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 definitely a problem. If we lose our allies for whatever reason, it's going to make us all the more isolated and certainly more vulnerable. Especially if China ends up helping Russia, right? That's a that's a scary thought. Yeah. <laughs> and energy is going to be part of it all, isn't it? It is. All right. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you doctor. for calling. You have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. So, so getting back to the notion of this is why energy is so important. It's you know one sixth of our economy, and it, it globally it affects everything. So, I think that's what the caller was pointing out is that you know when we have problems with international problems with you know gas shortages and the Russian oil embargo and Germany is shutting off its last nuclear power plant. I mean, these problems can cascade and create a lot more problems and and lead to unfortunately won't be the first time another war so i'm really concerned that we need to develop an resilient and energy secure economy and we need to have practically all the options on the table to generate electricity and including natural gas maybe not wood chips so much but at the end of the day energy security is going to be a more and more important topic as we continue and this is why i concerned so much about it and this is why I've spent my career trying to help solution to find solutions and I'm hop hopeful I'm optimistic but it's a challenge um, you're on the KJ show with Dr. Katherine Johnson your host on the Bold Brave TV network and I'll be right back what if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair what if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to EasySense.com and learn how, with your help, we can fight these horrific brain disorders. That's EasySense.com to learn more and help support the Broderick Foundation. Author, radio show host, and coach, John M. Hawkins, reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And welcome back to the KJ Show. I hope you've been enjoying our discussion today on... Um, ethical dilemmas of climate change. And so I wanted to wrap it up with something that may be a little more controversial or not. Um, but there may be some actual good effects if global warming is actually occurring. Um, because guess what? Loggerhead turtles are making a comeback in the Mediterranean. There's been a growing number of marine reptiles are nesting and laying eggs in the western Mediterranean beaches. Some scientists suggest that climate change may be contributing to this. Um, they believe the trend is happening along the Spanish, French, and Italian Mediterranean coasts, and it could be a new colonization process. So basically, the loggerhead turtles, another wonderful animal, I mean, I love my beavers, but turtles are pretty amazing too, they're considered a vulnerable species, and just while climate change is usually detrimental to wildlife, apparently some scientists say that the warming waters apparently have become more suitable for the turtles. And a few episodes ago, I talked about this turtle, Jonathan, in the Seychelles, who's 100 and, at least 180 years old. Well, apparently, um, these other turtles are staging a comeback, loggerhead turtle, along with the warming seawater, 
successful turtle protection programs have helped launch them globally launched so there's not just been global warming but it's also been the turtle protection programs have actually boosted the turtle population and helping them to lift their status above endangered so marine biologists in europe along this beautiful coast and tunisia are discovering far more nests on the beaches um, there are only three nests between 1990 to 2012 three nests a year 2020 they had identified 84 nests one of the main causes could be global warming climate change and areas where turtles never used to reach because they were not adequate for uh, laying eggs or it could be that turtles live a really long time and these behavioral changes must be observed over much longer periods because now turtles live to be upwards of 100 years old so it could be global warming or it could just be the natural evolution of turtles where they have signs when they you know times where they don't necessarily lay as many eggs and then other times when they lay a lot of eggs and just like I pointed out with Jonathan I think we need to have a longer term view than just 20 years maybe we should look at it through the lens of a turtle that lives up to where it could live up to 200 years and maybe this cycle that may or may not be global warming but it serves the turtles are coming back and it also shows that nature can do very well without us we really don't need nature uh, we man is not important to the you know we we're, we're causing problems whether it's global warming or not with pollution and all the other things nature does just fine without us and we have to remember that you know the ocean will clean itself and they will do just fine without man we need them which is why we need to be good stewards of our population which is what i really think should be the focus let's make sure we don't pollute the waters let's make sure we do the best we can and build houses that make sense for people that are actually affordable um, but i also wanted to point out ethical dilemmas is actually something i talk about a lot in my book um, written granted i haven't talked about it in a while but the whole notion of it was a huge ethical dilemma where the lead character has to decide if he's going to be correct and and do the right thing or if he's going to do something that's hard or easy and could be a lot easier to live with his wife and his family and there's huge conflict of interest and that was one of the reasons that fascinated me in writing the story is how people can you know how do we live through conflict of interest and when we're put to the ethical test are we going to rise above or are we going to give in to what people you know the easy way out so I think ethics are something that we should think about every day and I also hope that if you have a chance to check out my book or the audiobook please do it's a pretty fast read and people generally like the story but overall I hope you've enjoyed today's show I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson your host on the Bold Brave TV network you've been watching the KJ show and next week we'll continue our conversation about all things energy and probably a little nature thrown in um, thanks for joining us have a great day this has been the KJ Show. Tune in next week as Catherine shares her insights to current changes in the energy industry while drawing on her experience as an energy efficiency consultant for the past 30 years. Right here on the KJ Show.